So as you heard, my name is Roy Schindler. I was born in Schwartz in Czechoslovakia in 1929. I come from a family of eight children, six girls and two boys. We lived in a village. I don't know, has anybody ever been to Czechoslovakia? Probably. Well, now it's a Ukraine, by the way. The, it became Czechoslovakia after the First World War. Before the First World War, it was Austro-Hungary, okay? So, and my parents were born in Austro-Hungary, but in 1918, it became Czechoslovakia. Anyway, we lived in a house where th we were 10 people. We had three rooms. Uh, every room had beds, of course. We had no electricity. We had no indoor plumbing. Uh, we had no bathrooms or anything like that. I meant to say bathrooms instead of indoor plumbing. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we lived so primitively that probably if you would come and be in a place like this, too, you wouldn't believe how we lived. But the thing is, we didn't know any better, so it was fine for us. When you don't know something better, it always is good, right? So it's, anyway, so um, the Czech Republic was a great country during the Czech uh, government taking part of our world. All the Jew I'm Jewish, by the way. All the Jewish people had the same rights like everybody else. And uh, our village consisted, may consisted maybe of 1,500 people or less. I really don't know how many people. Um, but one of my sons, by the way, I have four children and nine grandchildren and one great-grandchild. And so one of my sons went on the internet and he found out that there were 600 Jewish people in my village. I really didn't know, because we never counted ourselves when we were there, but that's what he found out. So, uh, as I said, it was a nice life. My father was a tailor. He had a shop in the middle of town, and uh, you will probably see some pictures. Oh, that's my father. There's my, my father's shop. That's, I think, 1937, okay? So, uh, by, of course, by 1939, they took it all away. All the Jewish businesses were taken away, okay? So, so here we are living nicely uh, till 1939. 1939, um, half a dozen Hungarian soldiers marched into our town on bicycles, by the way. We had no public transportation. Nobody had cars. If you were rich enough, you might have a bicycle. You know what I mean? We could walk in my town from one end of the town to the other in half an hour. So uh, anyway, so... Uh, uh, 39, uh, half a dozen SS soldiers come in on bicycles, and nobody is objecting to it. You see, a lot of the people living there were Hungarian before they were born before the, you know, right before the First World War, and they didn't think that Hungary could do such terrible things. But the thing is, Hungary didn't do this all on his own. Hungary and Hitler were allies. So Hungary did all of Hitler's dirty work, okay? So they, well, they came in and n nothing special is going on. We completely ignore them. Nobody's objecting to them coming in. Uh, I really don't know where they ended up sleeping or whatever. But anyway, things, uh, little by little things started to change. Uh, within six months, most of the Jewish businesses were taken away. Okay, my father's uh, shop was taken away. And all the men in our town, 15 and older, were taken on, uh, for slave labor. They would pick him up on trucks Sunday morning and bring him back on Friday night. So, and you know, uh, being uh, Jewish, we were Orthodox Jews, by the way, okay? Uh, on a Saturday, you don't do anything. You just eat and have a good time, and also Friday night. So anyway, so um, things are going on. Little by little, things are getting worse. The business is taken away, uh, and the men are taken away for slave labor, and all our friends in our village uh, that were, used to be our friends. We went to school together. Our education ended at middle school. We had no higher education than middle school, okay? So, and, and within a year or so, as things go by, all our friends that were not Jewish started calling us dirty Jew, throwing rocks at us, and things were not so good. But what could we do? We, all of a sudden, we had no rights anymore. But before, we were practically the leaders of the t villages and towns, okay? Because most of the Jewish people were tradespeople. They learned trades. In the Jewish tradition in, in our villages, when the boys turned 13, they had a bar mitzvah. I don't know how many Jewish people are there are here. Uh, so, and after that, they, uh, they are trainees in different uh, professions, okay? 
so like my father would always have a couple of trainees in my, his shop training these boys to become tailors, okay? And in those days, they used to get married very young also. By 18, 19, you know what to do, and there, these things go on. So anyway, so as I said, all our friends, our neighbors' friends, uh, they don't want to be our friends anymore, and uh, throwing rocks at us and, and calling us all kinds of dirty words. I won't even uh, repeat it. Anyway, so things are going on, and so this is going on for about till 1944. We never thought that we are going to be taken away, okay? Because Hitler promised the Hungarian government that he's not going to take the Jews away, just like he did with all the Polish and other countries. He started taking people into the camps in 1939, okay? So in 1944 of uh, April, um, we had Passover, okay? And the last day of Passover was on nine, uh, April 11th. And the reason I know this I went to my synagogue and asked the rabbi, when was the last day of Passover in 1944? And it was a Saturday. So Sunday is Pas uh, the first day out, not Passover anymore. You know, during Passover, we don't eat bread. You know why we don't eat bread? Because when the, Egypt the, the Jewish people in Egypt, they were freed and they left Egypt, they never stayed in one place long enough to bake bread because when you bake bread, it takes a long time, probably six hours at least or seven hours. So they would just do things that take five minutes or 10 minutes to cook on the whatever they, what kind of ever fires they did, or, you know, whatever. So during Passover, we don't eat bread. So of course, you know, having 10 people in a house uh, and we are tired of the matzahs for a whole week or they call them crackers, whatever. Uh, so of course we did have a bakery in our town. town so my mom, mom says, go get a bread to, to the bakery. I'm walking to the bakery. Uh, to, uh, we, did, we walked everywhere, everywhere in our town. There was no public transportation. The only bus we might see once a week is coming from Munkaj to Ungvar. Munkaj had about 25,000 people, a big city co compared to what it was then. And Serednya was my middle town called, and Serednya means middle. And Ushorot was another town with a lot of people. So if people needed to go from Munkaj to Ungvar, they had to go through Serednya, okay? Anyway, so here we are, so, um, uh, so, and we had no radios. Radios were against the law, by the way. The minute the war started in Europe, in our part of the world, if anybody had a radio, they had to give it back, rip, uh, give it into the government. Not that, I don't, I don't know if maybe one or two people in our whole village had a radio, okay? Because that was really a luxury in those days. So anyway, so how are they gonna tell us the news? We had a man who had the drum, he would go to the farmer's market. You know, all the farmer's markets that we have in this country, I believe they all came from Europe because we all had farmer's markets in Europe. So this man, uh, he, he had the drum, and, and when there was news to be announced, he would go to the farmer's market, which was middle of the town, and announce all the news. And he's announcing all the news. All the Jewish people are going to be sent away. Uh, everybody's entitled to bring one bag. and. Uh, that's about it. So I'm listening to what he's saying. I pick up the bread and I go home and I tell, told my mother what I heard. She says, I'm, we know everything was going on already. You know, bad news travels very fast, right? So, uh, so right away, she's, my mother says to us, we need to, we had, we never traveled. So we did not have any luggage, really, okay? Um, so, uh, but we had a fabric store, of course, in the store. So we needed to get some burlap. So my mother said to me, go get some burlap and we're gonna sew up some bags and everybody can bring what they want. Just one bag, no more. So um, we did that and then uh, the next day, uh, when we, so we're getting ready to go. Uh, my mother said to us kids, everybody put on a couple of sets of underwear because we don't know where we're going and we don't know if we're gonna have a chance to do laundry, okay? So, excuse me. Couple of sets of underwear, couple of sets of socks and even a couple of dresses if you can because we, are, we don't know how long we're gonna be gone, okay? So anyway, so we did all this, and then the next morning we go to the, there was one school in our town. That's the only two-story building we had in our village or town, I don't know what you wanna call it. So we go to the school, and, they, and before, uh, they also made an announcement at the farmer's market for all the, for all the uh, people. If anybody has any valuables to bring it to the school, and they're gonna put it away for us, and they're gonna give it back to us when we come back. You know what BS means, 
okay? So my father uh, put a few pieces of jewelry together in a little shoe polish box. We didn't have much jewelry in those days, okay? Our kids, nobody had anything, really. My mother had a pair of earrings, a necklace, and maybe um, a, a wedding band. And my father also had a, a wedding band and a, a pocket watch. I'm wearing a chain on my neck. This is from my father's pocket watch. I wear this every day in my life. The, f the first thing after I get out of bed, this goes on my neck. I think that's what keeps me going, okay? So anyway, so the few pieces of jewelry were in there, and so we, my father put it in, and he, he hid it between the ceiling and a wall in a corner. How he got in there, I have no idea. There must have been an opening, and he covered it with dirt so nobody should see it. Because when they said to bring it over there and they're going to keep it for you, you know, we, our parents already were more informed. Me, as a kid, I was 14 years old in 1944, so I had no idea what was going on. We never discussed what was going in the rest of the world, okay? And as I said, nobody had new, no newspapers. We never had newspapers in our town anyway. So anyway, so we, we, go, we get together and we go to the school, and then they put us on oxen-driven wagons, okay? Um, they must have put in, I don't know how many, we squeezed like herrings, and they take us to the next city, which is about 20 kilometers away, okay, which is Ushorod. It's going and going and going. Let me tell you something. I could have walked it faster, okay? That's how slow it was going. We get there, and they put us at a, near a train station. The reason they put us there is so we should be ready to be shipped away. We had no, I, as a kid, I had no idea what was going on because politics were never discussed with kids, okay? It was all like for adults, okay? Anyway, so, and they had no housing there. They put up some make-believe tents, okay? And this was a train station where they used to ship a lot of all kinds of equipment for building and farms and stuff like that. The trains, the, the trains said, after they put us in the trains, we didn't even have seats in the trains, okay? So anyway, so, uh, so here we are in this place, and I don't remember what we did about food. I'm sure we took some food with us, but how much food can you carry for 10 people, maybe for one day or two days? So they must have supplied us with food, but I have no idea, absolutely. All I know is the horrors and everything else, not about the food. That I don't remember. So, um, so here we are. So, so we, they had some make-believe tents, so they must have squeezed in 10 to 12 or 14 people in each tent, and we kept each other warm. And this is April 1944. The temperature is about 25 degrees. But we lived in, in Europe. The, te the temperature, would the cold weather would come in in the fall, the snow, and it wouldn't leave before the spring. And I don't ever remember anybody shoveling any snow away. It just would stay there. And everything was frozen. And uh, so anyway, so here we are. Uh, and uh, and what, what also, what we wore, all our clothes, was probably made out of wool because it was a cl cold climate, okay? And uh, so we, of course, only took our winter clothes, uh, warm clothes. So here we are. And after being there about, um, I would say, Two weeks, I really don't know how long we were there, okay? We, were, we they brought in all the people from all the villages surrounding the big cities, okay? And uh, and they there were guards all around the area. They had guards with guns, guns and dogs, making sure nobody runs away. They said if anybody tries to run away, they're going to shoot them on the spot. So anyway, so here we are. So finally, it came our turn to be put on the train. They must have had thousands and thousands of people in this area, okay? Finally, they, we go on the train, uh, and they squeezed in uh, maybe 70, 80 people in every train. No seats, nothing, just sitting down or standing up or whatever. They lock the door, off we go. We're going and going. People are passing out in the train. People are dying. And the train took two and a half days to go from Ushorod to go to Auschwitz, Poland, okay? And how we know this is because one of my kids looked it up, and that's what it took, two and a half days. And the train did not stop once. So you, and there was no places where you could relieve yourself, okay? So you can imagine the smell in the train after two and a half days, okay? So finally, it's going and going, and the train stops. It slows down, and it stops. The door opens, and it's, uh, you know, all the dirty work was done by our own people. If they wouldn't do it, they would get killed on the spot. Everything in the camps was done by our own people. They had no choice. So this man in a striped uniform comes on the train, uh, shaven. 
That's the first thing they do when people got there. Shave you, all the hair everywhere. Anyway, so he comes on the train. He says he came to help us with our luggage, okay? And he comes to me. He says to me, how old are you? I said, I'm 14. He says, tell him you're 15. I had no idea what he was talking about, but I listened to him. He said, tell him you're 18. Not, did I say 15? No, he said 18, okay? So, uh, and he was looking around to see if he could uh, find other kids that he could, they could lie about their age because they did not bring us there to have a good time. They brought us there for slave labor. So, uh, so um, we get off the train and uh, we're walking. Uh, um, no, we get off the train and walk into a room probably double the size, okay? And uh, five in a row, always five in a row. And they put us in this, it's supposedly a bathroom. Uh, well, the, the okay, the selection, okay, we get off the train and there's three SS soldiers are selecting the people. My father and my brother is told to go to this line. My mother and three sisters and brothers to this line. My two sisters to this line. And he says to me, how old are you? I said, I'm 18. And my sister Helen didn't know that I was told to lie about my age. She said, oh no, she's only 14. I said, oh no, I'm 18. He let me go with my two older sisters, otherwise I wouldn't have been here. My mother and three sisters and brothers, they went straight into the gas chamber. So anyway, so here we are. So finally they march us into this building and uh, uh, they tell, told us take our, our clothes off and put it down. And uh, then they shave our hair everywhere, not only our heads, okay? And then they told us to pick up a dress from another pile, okay? A dress and shoes, clog shoes and a dress. Uh, no underwear, no nothing. So, so we all picked up a dress and a, a pair of clogs, and then we're waiting for further orders. And while we were in that room, uh, waiting for further, they were taking, and actually, when we got all undressed, the SS were taking pictures of us when we were all naked, okay? There was an SS man in the corner, I remember, he was taking pictures. So finally, we go outside, and we're standing in line and waiting and waiting, and then, uh, there's a man standing next to my sister with a dog and a gun and my sister and there's a fire behind the building and you can see smoke and you can see you can hear children crying ca calling for their mother or father or whatever uh, all kinds of funny noises so my sister said to this guard my sister Judy what is that noise he said they were burning hair so she said burning hair wouldn't make this kind of noise then he said they were burning cripples she didn't ask any more questions when we came into the living quarters the next day, we found out what they were doing. They didn't even give the people enough gas to kill them all the way. They would push them out the back door and burn them half alive. So we knew what happened to my mother and three sisters and brothers, okay? So here we are. So finally, they march us into the uh, living quarters. Auschwitz, it's Auschwitz-Birkenau, and there's three uh, camps. There's a Czech camp, a Hungarian camp, and a gypsy camp. You know, they did the same thing to all the gypsies too, okay? We used to have a lot, a lot of gypsies living in our, uh, not in our town, they always lived in the forests, you know, because the gypsies were always traveling from one place, they never had a solid place. So, um, so anyway, so, uh, we, we, uh, so, so they bring us into the barrack, barrack C, okay? Uh, and um, the, okay, and uh, there's 30 buildings. Each barrack holds a thousand women. One barrack was a kitchen, one barrack was a bathroom. The bathroom was sinks with cold water and holes in the ground, okay? So uh, we ended up in barrack 26, uh, three rows of bunk beds. No blankets, no nothing, mattresses, nothing. Just every, every bed, the bar you know, the bunk bed, there were like 10, 12 women. We kept each other's bodies warm, that's what. So uh, the temperature was probably 25 to 30 degrees in that time. Anyway, so um, uh, here we are. So we go, well, they march us into the barrack, and then we go to sleep. The next morning we get up, and they give us, uh, they serve us, uh, they don't serve us, excuse me, coffee for breakfast, a pot, maybe a six-quart pot. Give it to 10, 12 people, you take a sip. We have no canteens, no spoons, no nothing, okay? Uh, the coffee tasted like black soot. Anybody that would take a sip of it, they would pass out. I think I took one sip and I never tried it again. So that was our breakfast. So after that, I said to my sisters, I want to go outside. I want to know where I am, okay? So I go outside and I'm walking and I see this 12-foot electric fences separating the three camps, 12-foot high. 
and you see women, or women, because this was an old woman's camp, by the way, okay? Women holding on to the fences, dead. You see, we, we see dead bodies around the fences on the floor. A lot of people didn't know that those fences were electric. They would just touch it and they would, sometimes they would try to talk to the people in the other camp, you know? As I said, there were three camps next to each other. So you have no idea how many dead bodies they were around the uh, fences. Uh, some of them on the ground and some of them holding on. And also <coughs> in the walking area. We were walking, there is no streets, just certain walking areas and behind the barracks. Bodies everywhere. Nobody can imagine how horrible that place looked. Nobody can imagine that anything could have ever happened like what it was, okay? So I'm walking and walking, and all of a sudden, somebody calls my name. My Jewish name was Roisy. Roisy, Roisy. I said, my God. I, said, I thought to myself, I knew I was popular. I did know I was so popular that somebody should know me in this God-forsaken place. It was my father. My, this man in a striped uniform, uh, shape, my father, you saw a picture of my father over there, he had a, like a two-inch beard, well-dressed with a hat and suit and tie. This man is wearing shaven, uh, striped uniform. You know, when you're not used to seeing somebody a certain way, you have to look two, three times before you can recognize him. He says, Roisy, Roisy, don't you recognize me? I'm your dad. We hugged and we kissed, and the first thing he said to me, where is your mom? And at that time, I really didn't know yet what happened to my mother and my three sisters and brothers. So I told him I'm here with my two sisters, and we are in Barrack 26. And he said, they are, they are here temporarily. Him, my father and my brother, they were already selected to go to a factory to work. Uh, they're going to probably be here a day or two, because this is a woman's camp. And, and he said to me, whatever we should, he tells us what to do. He says, stay together, because you have a much better chance of surviving. And then stay alive so you can tell the world what they're doing to us. So he must have known already what was going on. But I didn't know anything. You know, 14-year-olds in those days were very ignorant. Okay? I mean, we didn't know much, okay? And especially uh, there were the past four years living in my village, there was no news at all. Everything was f forbidden. We had no... Uh, we couldn't even leave our villages without permission, okay? Unless if somebody's very sick, because uh, we had no doctors in our village either. So, as I said, we were brought up very, we didn't know much. Anyway, so here we are, uh, and so uh, we, my father, he, he hugs me and kisses me. He says, where is your mother? And at that time, I really didn't know. I found out about what they did is after the, maybe day later. I said, I'm here with my two sisters, Judy and Helen, and we're in Barrack 26, and, uh, and that's about it. So my, my father said, I'm here with your brother, Philip, we already have been selected to go to a factory to work, so they're there temporarily because this was a completely a woman's camp. They had two barracks of these men that came in the day before. They were put there temporarily. So we talked and we hugged and kissed. He said, whatever you do, stay alive so you can tell the world what they're doing to us. And we met again the next morning. I brought my two sisters and my father brought my brother and we, he repeated the same thing. And we said goodbye. I never saw my father and brother again. So here we are, uh, lunchtime they give us a slice of bread with a piece of margarine, and then uh, dinner time we get uh, soup in a pot. We have no canteens, no spoons, no forks, nothing. A pot maybe uh, for 10, 12 women, maybe a six quart pot, it's soup, and you share the soup from a pot, and the pot was uh, cabbage and potatoes and uh, maybe some carrots. If you would get a potato, that would have been a good day for you, and a lot of soot and dirt in it, okay? not edible for human beings. Anyway, so here we are. So this is going on for about, going on for a long time. Every other, maybe every two, three days they come, they need women to go to factories to work. So we just got there, so we said, uh, they come to the factory, to the barrack, to look for, say, 300 women or 200. We just got there, we don't have to do it, we're gonna wait. So we waited about 10 days before we started to try and get selected to get out of this God-forsaken place, okay? So, um, so we went out. Sometimes they would make us get undressed to see if we have enough flesh on our bodies. Otherwise, they put you into the gas chamber line. So, of course, when this happened, uh, the first three times, each time they put me a different line. I was probably a 14-year-old. I was very, after being there 10 days, probably didn't 
eat anything except the, maybe the piece of bread with a piece of margarine. So you can imagine, I must have lost quite, a, all, all of us lost a lot of weight. So they put me in the gas chamber line. And of course, when they do that, they tell you, you know, when you're in a place like this, people give you advice. If they don't keep you together, get out of the line. So uh, when they put me in a different line, I knew right away what to do. Make sure that nobody sees me, I would get out of that line because that line was for Auschwitz, for the gas chamber, okay? All the sickies and the skinny girls would go a different way. So, so we went for selections maybe three times or so, and then we and each time they would put me to send me into the gas chamber. And of course, I knew already what to do. You know, you learn a lot of things when you're in places like this and how to survive too. So I said, so my sister said, we're gonna hope the war is gonna end and we're gonna get liberated. So, uh, and this camp held, every barrack had a thousand women. We had 30 barracks. One barrack was a kitchen and one barrack was a bathroom. Thousands and thousands of people walking around like dead bodies. Half of them were like dead bodies. You could hardly make out what they're doing, okay? So, uh, and the reason they brought us there is all for to go to factories to work, okay? Otherwise, either you go to a factory to work or you end up in the gas chamber. So, uh, so you know, being a young girl, I did a lot of uh, things that I shouldn't be doing but because everybody tells you, they give you advice when you places like this, what to do to survive. And I listened to everybody and I, I took the advice and uh, I survived that place, okay? So after being there four months, okay, finally they're coming and, and you know, you get used to the food after being there all these months. You have no choice, you gotta eat, okay? Sometime I would go behind the kitchen and see if I can find a piece of bread you know, the, the stuff they used to throw out in the back, or maybe a potato or a something else, you know what I mean? So uh, I was always looking for food. And sometimes there were so many dead bodies all over the camp area, we would even go into, on the streets, dead bodies, we would go in their pockets, see if there's a piece of bread in their pockets. Because they're dead, they're not gonna eat it anymore anyway. So if you can find it, it's a good day for you, okay? Anyway, so this is going on and on. Uh, so, and uh, it's, it's amazing how much a body can take in conditions like this. Unbelievable, okay? So, after being there um, four months, first of all, we were there two months, and then we found out we had two cousins in another barrack, in barrack number two, okay? And they were in charge of food. You know what that means. You're going to get an exercise of bread every day. So, of course, when we found out, of course, they told us we should come and go to uh, barrack number two. Remember, uh, there were a thousand women in every barrack, and they would come and take women to go to factories to work. I don't think uh, they knew how many people they were in, in each barrack. So we, we had the opportunity to leave the barrack, to go to number two. And of course, for about a month, it was great because my cousins were still there, and they would give us a little extra bread or whatever else. And then, of course, finally, they were selected to go to factory to work. So we were there without our relatives, so the well, things were not so good. But in the meantime, you know, we got used to the horrible conditions. It's amazing how much a person can take, really. So finally, they came to our barrack. They need 300 women to go to a factory to work in Freudenthal in Germany. So I said to my sisters, you go out and get selected, okay? Uh, they would come to the barracks and the three SS soldiers all the time, and I think one of them was Mengele. Anyway, so uh, I said, you go out and get selected, and I'll see how I can uh, steal myself into the transport. So they went out front. There's always five in a row, by the way. And the barrack, you know, there's al always leaders in every barrack, women that are giving out the food and make sure that there is no problem. So as, as I'm l standing there thinking, how am I going to get out of this place, I see one of the leaders in our barrack go out to the back door, okay? The selections were in the front. And... Uh, she lets her out, and I quickly chased to the barrack. The barrack was probably, I would say, three times the length of this, okay, those barracks. So I ran to the back, and she says, where are you going? You're supposed to go through the front to get selected. I said, I said, my mother just walked out. I want to go with her. How this came into my brain to say that, I have no idea. She lets me out. My sisters held a place for me. That's how I got out of Auschwitz-Birkenau, okay? So here we are for four months. We haven't had a cleaning, okay, in four months. Can you imagine how many lice our bodies have? We couldn't sleep at night because we were full of lice. 
So anyway, so of course they're not gonna send us to any factory to work in that condition. So they're taking us to the bathroom, okay? And of course they're shaving our hair again. The first time, uh, did I tell you that they shaved all our hair the first time? Okay, now they're shaving our, after being there four months, we have like maybe three inches of uh, hair or something. They shave our hair and they shave not only the, ha the head everywhere and they disinfected our bodies, okay? And they gave us decent clothes, underwear, socks and shoes. Unbelievable the difference between what we had the last four months. So here we are so waiting for further orders. Finally, they march us outside and they give us all a number. On our, we did never wore uniforms, our group. So they put a number on our dresses, like a label, okay? And I have a number on my arm. You see this? But they didn't tattoo us in, Freud, in, in Auschwitz. They tattooed us when we came to, the, to Freudenthal. Two people had to hold me and they used like electric needles. So uh, this is, and most of the people that were working in Germany, in, in, uh, people from Auschwitz being taken to factories to work, they, most of them had numbers. The rest, thousands and thousands of people went into the gas chambers, they were never counted. They say six million Jews were killed in, um, during the war, a lot more, because none of the, in April and May of 1944, over 500,000 Hungarian Jews were brought to Auschwitz. 80% of them went straight into the gas chamber. Okay, the only people they tried to save, they want needed was the people to work in factories. So here we are, uh, dressed and everything ready to go. So of course we waited quite a long time. Uh, we dressed in decent clothes and it's already the fall of probably, I would say September or October. So it was not too cold yet, but it was still, but we had the right clothes for that day. So finally they put us on trucks and they shipped us to Freudenthal in Germany, okay? And that was a factory where they were making uniforms, working on guns, and also on masks. I was assigned to work on masks. I had to sit on a high chair and pick up a mask and look at it and down, up and down for about 12 hours all day long, okay? And my sisters, one sister, Helen was, uh, I think, working on a machine making uniforms, and Judy was working on guns. So, and they would feed us a nice lunch. I mean, it's like heaven compared to Auschwitz, okay? So here we are working and they're always telling us if we don't do good jobs, they're gonna send us back to Auschwitz. And Auschwitz is one answer, the gas chambers, okay? So this is going on for about eight months or so, maybe eight or nine months. And then and every morning they would come and walk us to the factory. Uh, we had electric fences around, surrounding our building. Uh, not that anybody would run away after going through Auschwitz. We were glad to be where we are because they treated us like human beings, you know, fed us good and gave us clean. Once a week we had a shower and we would change our clothes. So uh, nobody would run away in that time, okay? So nobody's, so we're waiting to be picked up but nobody's coming. And, uh, and so I said to my two sisters, I wanna go outside and see what's going on. And we're not supposed to leave the building, okay? So everybody says, you can't go outside, you're gonna get shot. I said, I don't care, I'm going. You see, this is how I survived. I was always doing things I wasn't supposed to do. That's, you know, sometimes you need to do that, okay? To survive, okay? Or get what you want, all right? So I go out and the thing is, doors were locked all the time because the SS would come to the door and open the door for us. Somehow that night, they didn't lock the door. This must have been April, April 7th. Um, April 7th, or not 8th. I mean May, excuse me. May 7th or maybe 6th, I'm not really sure. So uh, I go outside, the door is open, I go out, and I said, my God, the gate, the, we had an fen, uh, electric fence all around that building. I think it was electric, nobody ever touched it, but we had electric fence. The gate was wide open, all the Germans ran away, okay? So, and then, I hear uh, behind our building where we lived, they were growing a lot of corn. You know, corn is very big. And the Russians were coming through the corn fields. They're coming to liberate us. And I hear the Russian language and I hear some shooting and there's planes going all over us. And of course, I was out in the build, out of the building my, and all my, my sisters and all everybody, they, I was screaming up to them, come out because the, I, think the, I think the Russians are here. I think they're being liberated. Anyway, so I figured I'm going to go and meet the Russians. So, of course, going in a regular, uh, you know, uh, dress uh, with very little hair on my head, 
uh, going in front of the Russians. Well, actually, I had normal hair on me at that time. That's May 1945. Uh, uh, they might think I'm a German, and they would shoot me on the spot. So what I did, I found a rag and put it in a stick, and I went like this in front of the Russians, in back of the buildings to the fields. The Russians came and liberated. They were very good to us. Anything we needed, they would bring it to us. And if they didn't have it, they would take us to town. They, they would come and say, you want to go to town? Because, you know, all the Germans in town ran away because they knew when the Russians are coming, the Russians were very easy with the guns, okay? So the next day, the Russian soldier came. He says, do you want to go to town? I said, I would love to go to town because all we had was one set of clothing. That's it. Because we would change clothes once a week, and they would be, take our dirty clothes and then give us clean clothes. No extras. So uh, I said, we, I could use an extra dress and come some underwear and stuff like that. So, of course, I was afraid to go by myself with this six-foot-tall Russian soldier. I said, can, I bring a, can we bring a friend? So he said, yes. So I tell you, that day when he took me and my friend to, uh, to town, which was only like a seven-minute walk, I think I, the, my body felt like it was reborn. It's a very unusual feeling in your body. You're free. You can do what you want. You can go where you want. Nobody can imagine what this felt like. Anyway, so we went into town, and all the German homes were open. They didn't even lock their doors. They all ran away because they knew when the Russians are coming, they're going to kill. They were very easy with the guns. So, um, so we took what we needed, and of course, how much can you carry, okay? So anyway, so within a few days, a lot of us ate too much. We got sick because we overate. You know, when your stomach is not used to a lot of food, you can get, eat too much. So when your tummies are full, give it up. <laughs> so anyway, so here we are. And we're having a good time, kind of, because we're hoping, uh, you know, things will get better. We're, we're not going to be we sick for a few days. And finally, we decided we have to go home. We're going, we were hoping my father and brother survived the war. We knew that my mother and four, four sisters and brothers are gone. So, so we go to the train station. And the trains didn't run in those days like they run today, OK? Um, so um, uh, we had to stay at the train station three, four days before we could get on a train. And, there, and you know, a lot of camps were being uh, liberated in those days. And there were a lot of camps all over, Poland and Germany, you know, all over the place. And the trains were always so full of people, not only survivors and soldiers and all kinds of things. So, so we had to stay at the train stations for three, four days sometime. But while we were at the train station in, in Freudenthal, my sister Helen, she met a young Jewish soldier at the train station, and they fell in love. He was so good looking, all the girls fell in love with him. But my sister got him, OK? <laughs> so of course, uh, so, so, uh, so he's leaving to report to his group, to the military, in the Czech uniform and everything. And we are going a different way. He, so he gave, a, he gave my sister the key to his house in Prague. He said, go home and see who survived the war. Then you come to Prague, and you're going to live with me. And this was a great idea. So we said, OK. So we said goodbye. And the next day, we were, went on the train. And we ended up on the top train. We couldn't even get seats inside the train, OK? The trains were so full, you have no idea. So we're going. Of course, uh, uh, the trains did not take us all the way, because they had no direct trains in those days. I mean, if you go here from, from here to New York, you wouldn't have a direct. Or maybe there is a direct train from here to New York. So we had to change trains all, all, every day, practically. And all of a sudden, the whole world was very nice to us, offering us to sleep in the house, giving us food. Where was the world when we needed them? That's what I want to know. Nobody bothered to help us. The whole world was silent while this was going on, OK? So anyway, so it took us about uh, four weeks to get home. We went through all kinds of countries, uh, Hungary and stuff like that. And when we came home, our house was not livable. And the first thing we did was go for the jewelry, OK? The little shoe polish box with the, you know, the chain that I have on my neck and a few other pieces, OK? So, uh, but the house was not, the roof was gone. I don't know what they did to it, but it was not livable. But you know, the s survivors were coming home, other survivors, and they got their homes back, OK? So we ha had places to stay, OK? So we're hoping my father and brother would come home. Little by little, people are coming home. From 600 Jewish people that lived in our village, I think maybe 15 or 18 people came back to my village. That's it. So after being in my town for about 
five, six days, somebody comes home and, and he tells us he was with my brother in a camp working. And 10 days before they were liberated, they took out the uh, 300 men into the forest, made them dig a big hole, and they killed everybody. That's what they did a, a lot of people because they didn't want people to survive to be able to tell their stories, okay? So we knew my brother is gone. Then somebody came back that was my, with my father, and he also told me that he also told us that my father was working in a factory not far from Auschwitz, and um, he got sick, and then they put him in the gas chamber. So we knew there's no reason for us to stay here anymore. We don't have a house. My father's shop is gone. So, um, so Helen says, I am leaving to Prague because we have the key to, she has the key to Tibor's house. So she left for Prague and I, Judy and I stayed behind because we wanted to see who else is coming back from the war, you know. I don't think we had 15, 18 people in our town, okay? We were 1,600 before the war. So I stayed another couple of weeks and then uh, I decided, I said, it's time to go to Prague, okay? So, of course, my sister, so we go to Prague and we cannot get a, we, the Russians, this is occupied Russia, by the way. They don't want to give us permission to leave. They want everybody to stay there. So, um, I, so we stayed at the train station for three to four days before we could get a permit to leave. Finally, uh, Judy says to me, I'm going back to my hometown. One of the boys came back from the war. He got his house back and he wants to marry me. So my sister Judy went, and I was still at the train station waiting to get a permission to leave. So Judy went back to my hometown, and eventually she, they got married, and that's the last time I saw her, okay? And I left, and I went to Czechoslovakia, and we came to, uh, I came to Prague, and um, my sister Helen said, there is a, a Jewish man by the name of Sir Leonard Montefiore, who is a philanthropist in London who is looking for a thousand Holocaust survivor children under age 16 to take to England for rehabilitation. And Helen said, I signed you up. It would be a good idea for you to go. She wouldn't go. First of all, she was 21 years old then, and they wanted people uh, under age 16, even though we n none of us had IDs. Anybody could have gone, okay, in this transport because they didn't ask for identification. So, uh, so she signed me up. And I left for England, uh, for uh, Scotland. So of course, um, they, the planes, you know, the, the, the planes that came to pick us up from England, they were all bomber planes. They had even holes in the middle of the train. You could see down where they would throw the bombs down. So uh, he found 732 kids, okay? There's, there's some of the kids in our hostel in Prague. And I think three or four of us are still alive from that group, okay? So, so we go to Prague, okay, and, um, and then, of course, I'm, I mean, we're going. So the first transport left uh, June, of, June or July of 1945. August. August? Oh, there's a book out called The Boys, if anybody's interested to read it, okay? It gives you all the information. I don't know why they called it The Boys, because we had girls there too, okay? But I think 20% were girls and the rest were boys. You know, more boys survived the wars than girls. I don't know why, but anyway. So, uh, so the first transport left in July, and I said to my sister, I'm staying in my sister's place, there's no rush for me to go. So I didn't go before February 1946. February 12th was the last transport. That's when I left. So I uh, ended up in Scotland, okay? They had hostels all over England, Scotland, Ireland, wherever they could find a hostel for 732 kids. So I ended up in Scotland. We were about 35 kids. They were teaching us English. They were teaching us Hebrew. Uh, they were even trying to send us to school, but it never worked out because we couldn't speak a word of English, okay? So, uh, so after going to that school for about five, six weeks, we just, the, the leaders decided they're gonna teach us English in the hostels. And that's what they did, okay? So, so of course, a lot of the kids, you know, uh, are going to Israel because it's finally we need a country of our own so this should never happen again, okay? And the hostel, the, uh, the organization that we belong to uh, that was doing this transportation for all, the, who brought 732 kids was all a Zionist organization and we were all going to go to Israel, okay? But a lot of us decided not to go because there were too many troubles in Israel. We went through hell. We are not ready to go through it again. Uh, so many kids that went from our group to England after five, six days, they, the minute they came into Israel, before Israel became a state, they would come in at night 
in the ships, they would take them straight into the military, girls and boys, by the way, okay? So of course, you had to be, I think, 18. So and some of them were younger, and some of them, the older ones, a lot of them got killed within a week or 10 days. So anyway, so here we are. So we're in Scotland, and everything is going good. And finally, a lot of kids are leaving, going here, and find, finding relatives in America, uh, Australia, and New Zealand, and whatever, Bolivia. So, uh, so we were a dozen of us left in England, in Scotland. So they told us we could go to Bedford, we could go to Manchester or Liverpool or London. So the Zionist organizations was in Bedford. So our group went to Bedford, and they were all. When we came there, they were all boys, about thirty boys or so. And uh, so they introduced us the next day, and there was a young man in back of the of the row. And uh, that's, my, that's my boyfriend, my husband. I saw this young man in the back. I said, that's the man I'm going to marry. Of course, it took me a while to get him. Because, you know, all of a sudden, all the non-Jewish girls in Bedford, they would come to the hostel. They like the Jewish boys. They know what's good, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he already had a girlfriend. She actually was very pretty, probably prettier than me. But anyway, so, but I got him in the end. So finally we, uh, finally we are in Bedford and then the hostel is emptying out because the kids are going to America. A lot of kids found relatives in the United States, Canada, all over. So we are, a few of us left, so we're gonna go to, to London. So, this, this, the, so they shipped us to London and they put us in homes and would rent homes in certain rent rooms in certain homes that the homes, home owners would take care of us because we were still under 18 years old, young kids. So I ended up in, in Wilson Green. Has anybody ever been to London? Wilson Green is not far from the city, from Marble Arch, you know, it's the West London area. I'm running out of time, okay. Anyway, so we are in London and little, little by little, um, I'm dating Max, we started dating. Okay, in 1948, we got engaged. In 1950, we got married. There you go, at the West London Synagogue, okay? And we stayed in London for, and we got an apartment. And in 1951, uh, Max uh, had a relative in the United States who offered us papers to come to America. I said, that's my dream, we should go to the United States. So we came to the United States, and that's Coney Island, by the way. So we came to the United States in 1951. Uh, uh, they, uh, so there were no relatives who wanted to put us up in their homes. Nobody offered us any ho housing. So we found a room in somebody's house, a Jewish family, they offered us a house and you know paid so much money. Anyway, so one month, one year we lived in a, somebody's house. Within another year, uh, we were working, we got jobs. Within five days being in New York, we found jobs, okay? I worked in the garment industry, by the way. Uh, so anyway, so we did very well in New York. After being in New York for five years, my husband came to San Diego to visit a friend who was in the military because all the boys had to report to the military, you know that. So uh, he comes to San Diego, 1955, for three days. He calls me, I'm not coming back to New York. Pack up your, pack up, we already had a daughter in New York, she said, pack up, pack up, you're coming to California. So we came to San Diego in 1950s. I came to 56, Max came in 49, 59, okay? Those was my three kids when they were young. I had two of my kids here, but um, I have my son here and my, my, my daughter-in-law and my grandson here. So anyway, so uh, we have four kids, we have nine grandkids, we have one great-grandchild, and I wanna tell you that we are so grateful to this country because this is the best country in the world, guys. No matter where you come from, there's no better country than America, okay? So, and we are grateful having a, made a new life for ourselves. And uh, I speak a lot at, I do butterfly, I speak a lot at butterfly projects. And there I got the, uh, uh, the um, honorary degree at country day school, okay? I had three and a half years of education, by the way. And actually I got more than an honorary degree. I even got an honorary degree from a college too, okay? What did I, um, yeah, yeah, okay, so. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, there you are. This is my last picture with my husband. I lost my husband almost three years ago. We were married 67 years. It's terrible to be alone, let me tell you. 
Um, he was the only man in my life. I had other boys who were after me, but I did, once I met, saw his face, I didn't want anybody else. That's how it was. So anyway, thank you very much for listening to me.